Okay, welcome to the On Your Side podcast. I'm Gary Harper. And I'm Susan Campbell. Susan, how was your Labor Day weekend? It was great. Football season started. Oh my gosh. So I got to watch some football. I know. Well, I really don't want to bring that up because my team lost and th that was bad. I, I saw it was like a, a it, nail biter a little bit, it was, wasn't it? it? Absolutely. It was a double uh, overtime. It was a game we should have won because it was against, so it was Texas Tech against Wyoming. It was in Wyoming. Um, Wyoming, the Cowboys, they are very unpredictable. So we deserved to lose because we just didn't have our act together. Well, so, it's okay. Hey, I was in Chicago this weekend. How was it? Oh, it was great. Met my son there. We stayed downtown. We did all the eating and all. Good I actually, pizza, deep dish. I had the deep yeah. dish. And I remember telling another guest on our podcast that I did not really like uh, the deep dish sh uh, Chicago pizza. Did you change your mind this I, time? I totally changed my okay. mind. Oh my goodness! It was oh, it was. I'm so it, glad to hear that. It was. I mean, my I got it for my son. He's 23. And he's never had deep dish before, so I'm like, let's get this. And then I'm like, I'm not gonna like it. But then it came, and I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah. And well, I, that makes the Italian in me very happy. Oh. <laughs> That's right. Are you, you're half Italian, right? A little less than that. I'm, Quarter. I'm, I, <laughs> but I like to claim it. I'm Irish. But, um, oh, I had the Chicago dog, the whole thing. All it, of it. It was good. You had and, the experience. And <clears throat> I came back two pounds lighter. <laughs> I want that diet. Because, <laughs> how, how well, do I do that? He, you know, my son's 23, and he's obviously a lot younger than me, and we biked everywhere, and we walked everywhere. So basically everything that we were consuming, we were just- Burning those calories. Burning those calories. Okay. Yeah, I'm surprised I, I was able to keep up with them. Uh, hey, listen, we're talking about college loans, and they had um, uh, a little bit of a pause there for a couple of years because of COVID. Big time pause, yeah. Yeah, big time pause. And uh, that pause is now getting ready to stop. So you and I talked before, uh, when you were in college, um, you were fortunate enough, you, you really didn't have to take out any loans. My family took um, a couple small loans for me, mm. um, but it was a really big deal for my parents that this was, their parents had paid for their college and that was their gift to to me and my brother, that yeah. they were going to pay for college. So um, I, yeah, I got so, so incredibly lucky and blessed with that because yeah. it can be such debilitating debt. Yeah. Good, good old mom and dad took care of you. My parents took care of me as well, paid for my college. But there are, um, I mean, not every mom and dad or every parent can do that for their kids out there. And, and college just keeps getting more and more and more expensive. I don't understand the tuition and everything that goes into it. One of our coworkers just put his kid into uh, Arizona State University, and uh, gosh, I think he said it was tw uh, $25,000 a year. That includes- That sounds like a bargain to that's... me. My alma mater is, my alma mater, I just looked, uh, I think it was up to like 70000 a year. Syracuse? Syracuse, yeah, maybe sixty-five or seventy. It was a bonkers amount of money. And when you include room and board and food and the things that you need to live yeah. for the year. Oh my yeah, gosh. I know. And people are taking out loans because they want that college degree and they feel like they they need it to yeah. kind of get ahead in life. And I feel like I have to qualify this now. I have been out of college for a very long time, so my parents did not pay that much money a year. Yeah, I, and there were grants and scholarships and things involved. That, that's true. Yeah, back back in the day, um, it was not as, yeah. as as expensive as it is today. You know, I'm a big trade school guy. I mean, I'm a believer. You don't really need a college degree. Just go to trade school, but I digress. We're getting off on, on things here. Hey, today we're talking to Robert Farrington. He is the founder of The College Investor, and he calls himself America's millennial money expert. Robert, how are you today? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Why do you call yourself the college or the, let me say, America's millennial money expert? What do you know? I am a millennial and I know a lot about money, especially everyone struggle with getting out of student loan debt and then hopefully getting to the good part of building wealth and investing. But we got to overcome that first hurdle, right? Well, so let's start there. What is the landscape right now of student loan debt? What are we actually looking at before we jump into maybe some of those solutions? Yeah. So, I mean, we have $1.7 trillion in debt in this country, all held by student loans. And we have over 45 million borrowers. And as you guys mentioned at the beginning of the show, student loan payments are resuming next month in October for the first time in about, you know, what, three years at this point in time. So uh, it's a big shock for a lot of borrowers. And I'd say 20% of those borrowers have never made a student loan payment because they graduated in the last three and a half years. And so, you know, this is their first time dealing with it. And I think a lot of people are scared, worried, confused because 
there are a lot of options. Um, you know, they don't make it easy to repay your student loans. And uh, yeah, it, it's just a really big struggle right now. Yeah, we're going to jump into uh, the Biden administration's SAVE program in just a minute. But at the top of the show, we mentioned that uh, you help people escape student loan debt. Now, that doesn't mean like get rid of it some in some criminal way, not pay it. You're not telling people not to repay their student loan, are you? Absolutely not. So not repaying your student loan is probably the worst financial mistake you can make uh, in this country. But with that being said, about 50% of all student loan borrowers qualify for some type of student loan forgiveness program. We're not talking like new laws or anything. We're talking about what exists today in this country. And with that being said, I also like to help people pay as little as they legally have to pay on their student loans. I think a lot of people feel this need that they have to pay it off. And the fact is, there's a lot of programs like these loan forgiveness programs, like the new save program that you touched on, uh, that it might not make sense to like throw extra money at your student loans. In fact, it might make you poorer to throw extra money at your student loans today. So there's so many nuances to the student loan debt issue. Um, and so we like to help people navigate that so that hopefully when they're done, they come out a little bit wealthier. So we have a lot of listeners right now who have a student loan that they're gonna have to start repaying, but there, this new option under the uh, this, this administration is called Saving on a Valuable Education. The acronym is SAVE, S-A-V-E, that they have come up with. What is SAVE? And is it a good or a bad idea for people who have student loans? Absolutely. So SAVE is a new repayment plan, but it's actually a rebrand of an existing one. That's how the Biden administration has kind of pushed this through. So the SAVE is actually a newer version of the repay student loan repayment plan. And this plan is amazing because it's income based. So your monthly student loan payment is going to be based on your income. If you don't make a lot of money or you have a large family, your student loan payment could legally be $0 a month. And so it has the potential to save a lot of Americans a lot of money every single month. The way it works is that you can apply for these plans on studentaid.gov or go to your loan servicer, and then you put in your income. You put in last year's, they'll pull your taxes for you automatically, or let's just say maybe you're unemployed or you have a different income today. You can type in the amount and say what you make, and it'll calculate your monthly payment at either five to 10% of your discretionary income. And that payment is what you're gonna pay for the next year. And so you gotta recertify that income every year. How do you qualify for something like that? I mean, are there uh, people with debt that are not going to qualify? So everyone with a direct student loan qualifies. There are some people that might not qualify like parent plus borrowers. So if your parents might've taken a loan for your college education, and if you have really old student loans, these are FFEL, federal family education loans, that those are loans from well before 2007. So if you have really old loans or you have parent loans, you might not qualify. But for everybody else, you can definitely qualify for this program. There are millions of people who have already signed up. Um, do you expect millions more? I mean, is this kind of a slow rollout of this program? Yeah, you know, the administration announced yesterday that, what, 4 million people had already signed up for this program, which is awesome. Um, the estimate is within seven years, 99% of all loan borrowers will be on this program. Like, that's the estimate because it is such a great way to repay your student loans. It makes sense for almost everybody. Um, why is it taking so long, though, is that this was just announced in July. Uh, honestly, a lot of people haven't looked at their student loan payments. They're like, oh my gosh, I got my first bill coming due. Maybe I should take action. So honestly, over the next 30 days, I expect that number to really maybe even double. Um, and then over the next year or so, it's going to increase even more. But really, I think people are just getting back into the groove of what is my student loan debt? What do I need to do? So this lowers the monthly payment. Does the total amount remain the same? I mean, am I going to be paying a monthly, you know, if I can, if I qualify for, a, a payment of a hundred bucks. Am I going to be paying on that loan until I'm a hundred years old? No, that's what makes this plan so great. So all income driven repayment plans include loan forgiveness at the end, 20 or 25 years. So this new save plan though, it doesn't let your loan balance grow, right? So even if you don't pay the full amount because your loan payment maybe is zero, or like you said, a hundred dollars, you will never see your balance grow. It could only go down. And guess what? If it doesn't go down over that 
you know, 20 years, it'll get forgiven at the end. And that's why it doesn't always make sense to pay extra on your loans. I'd rather you save, if you have a little bit of extra money, invest it, build some wealth and see that loan forgiven and have a little nest egg. Can we go back what you just said? You could, you could stretch out your payments, but then at uh, some period it goes away. Exactly. So all income driven repayment plans, including save, but even the existing ones, income based repayment, pay as you earn. These programs have already existed since 2007. After 20 or 25 years, your loan is just forgiven. Any payment that's left on it is done. And so that's what I don't think a lot of people realize. It's a long time. It's not great. But if you graduate at 22 by 43, you could be debt free. You know, that, that's if you don't, I mean, if you don't make a ton of money, right? Like if you're making a ton of money, you're not going to qualify for that super cheap monthly plan. Let, let me just be devil's advocate here. And I know a lot of listeners might be thinking the same thing. Is this going to keep people from wanting to get a promotion or wanting to uh, better themselves? Because I make $30,000 a year and I don't want to pay more than my $50 a month on a student loan. So it, I feel knowing what I know about this plan, it's not going to really uh, encourage people to better themselves because why would they? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely savvy ways to keep your payment low, but on the flip side, this is set on the poverty line. So let's be honest, if you're making $35,000 a year, your life is already a struggle and adding a student loan payment to that isn't really gonna make a big difference in your life. And you should hopefully be looking to better yourself. I think where the real issue here lies in the moral hazard side of it, which I think you're alluding to, is it does nothing to fix the college cost problem. So all we are doing is saying, okay, well, if you borrow a lot of money, at some point in time, it'll be forgiven. But like colleges can keep charging whatever. So like you mentioned Syracuse at 70K. Probably when you went there, it was in the 20s or maybe even the 10s. It's like colleges can keep raising their tuition rates knowing full well that even if their borrowers and graduates struggle, after 20 years, who cares, right? <laughs> the amount will be forgiven. It is astounding. I mean, I have I have four-year-old and two-year-old, as our listeners know, and it is terrifying to me that at some point in the not too distant future, the college conversation is happening. And how in the world do you actually plan for that and afford it? Right. Yeah. Right. It's a big deal. Uh, where did this 20 year forgiven uh, loan? I can't get over this. I, have you heard about it? Mm -hmm. It just forgives in 20 years. Well, I have. Where, where, is, is <laughs> His that... eye, for our listeners, Gary's eyes are really big. I he's mean, doing I'm... the he's doing the eye bugging out thing. Look, okay, <laughs> because I'm old school. You take out a loan and you sign papers to promise that you're going to pay it back, and that all goes out the window because in 20 years I'm going to be debt free on my student loan anyway. I just it sounds great if you're if, if you have no morals. <laughs> That's what is what it looks like. On the flip side, though, like he was saying, would you want to live in a perpetual state of not making any money or advancing in your career? Like, that just doesn't make sense. I feel like I feel like why would you, you know, why would you not want to earn more money? Well, and, and people will some people, maybe a lot, will want to make more income in order to pay down that student loan. But maybe they yeah, they're, they're, they got all, all kinds of promotions over the course of 20 years, but they still have. Uh, ten or fifteen thousand dollars left that they need to pay, it's out the window. Doesn't have to pay it, right? I, I yeah, all, all based yeah. on a whole bunch of math. I'm just being devil's <laughs> that's, advocate. That's above our heads. I know a lot of listeners are. Yeah, are no, probably, for sure. Pr probably a, a, a green. Hey, let me throw a curveball at you with numbers, and I don't know if you if you uh, have the numbers, but um, let's just say somebody out of college. Um, they worked for say, let's just say they're 27, 28. Now they have to resume and they're making, I'll just throw a number out. They're making 60,000 a year. Um, roughly how much, um, out of a $60,000 annual income is their student, uh, monthly payment? Yeah, you know, if they're a single person making $60,000 a year, you know, on the new save plan, they're going to pay about 113 bucks a month. 
Um, and you know, that's only if they have one kid, if they have four kids or four, you know, people in their household, it could be $0 a month. So, um, since it's all based on your income, it doesn't actually matter what your loan amount is. And that's where this math kind of gets really funky. But if you're making $60,000 a year, 27, 28, you're going to pay about a hundred bucks a month towards your student loans. A hundred dollars is nothing. And if you're making 60 grand and you're single, you're going to have some money left over. So you're advocating using whatever leftover your money that you have to apply it towards some kind of retirement or savings um, fund. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Because I would rather, you know, you could put this extra money to your loans. Let's say you could, but then when you're done with your student loan debt, you're at a $0 net worth, right? Like you put all this, you got out of the negative and you got to zero and that's great. But you know, if you focus on maybe contributing to your 401k or your IRA, you could actually lower your adjusted gross income, right? So because it's pre-tax, it lowers what you pay in taxes. Well, guess what? You also just lowered your student loan payment because it's based on your taxable income. So you could not only put money into your 401k and build some net worth for yourself, but you could also lower your student loan payment in the process. And so there's a lot of levers you can pull. And that's why I advise people to save for yourself. I kind of agree with you on the, on the public policy perspective, but I will never ever tell an American to pay more to the government than they should. So let's all go out there. If you sign on that dotted line, you should be paying as little as you legally have to on your student loans um, and build some net worth for yourself. Let's talk about the people who are facing this kind of maybe scary unknown. Like you said, a lot of people haven't ever paid uh, a monthly payment toward their student loan debt. Um, we have a couple weeks left until these payments resume. What do they need to do right now to make sure that their house is in order? So at least we've got the first loan payment and the second loan payment, third loan payment covered, and we're not stressed. Absolutely. So I recommend everyone, first off, just get organized with your loans. You know, the average borrower when they graduate college has five student loans, um, and they could be at different places. So what you need to do is go on to studentaid.gov. You need to find out who your loan servicer is if you don't know. Um, it could be like the Navians, the Nelnets, the, the Mohilas. See who owns your loans. Make sure you sign up for an online account with them and make sure your contact information is updated. Like, let's be real. You might have taken out these loans using your parents' address or your college address. You might have moved since then. Your email address might have changed. It might have been like at your school's university.edu. Now you need to get it set up to your real one. Because the bottom line is you don't want to miss those first communications from your loan service or you don't want to miss that monthly statement. You want to make sure you set up auto pay if you want to. So Go in, find your loans, and then set up an online account with your loan servicer and make sure all your contact information is updated so that you don't miss anything when it comes to your loans. If you do have those, you know, like you said, five different loans, how does um, how does something like the SAVE program divide up or come up with what loan gets what amount of money? Yeah, so it just puts it all together in a pile and then it gets distributed down through your loans. Usually your loans are all at one servicer and it just gets kind of laid out little by little and piecemealed out as a percent of each of your loans. If people are really interested in the SAVE program, what do they do? How do they sign up for it and how long does it take? T tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, the easiest way to sign up for it is through your loan servicer's website or studentaid.gov and that's the Department of Education's website. and Typically, to change your repayment program, it'll take a week or two. But right now, we're hearing that a lot of these loan services are a little overwhelmed. And so don't be surprised if it takes like four or five weeks to get that process. And you might see some funky things in your account. It might say like, you know, you're still in uh, forbearance, for example, when you apply. And that's normal. It'll get processed. It's just there's a lot of people doing everything all at once. Talk to us about life after student loans. Say we have, you know, loan payments resume. We've got a few months left and then it's all done. We actually get it covered. It's at a zero balance. What do we start doing after that to make sure we are, you know, making the most of this payment that we've gotten used to maybe paying? Yeah. I mean, once you start going, like if you are done with your student loans and you have a zero balance, you should take that money and start investing it. Um, you know, you got a loan for college. That was great. But guess what? You don't get a loan for retirement. So now you need to start looking at that next goal down the road. And how do I take care of myself so that, you know, I can have a comfortable lifestyle when inevitably I can't work anymore. And, you know, for some people that could happen sooner rather than later. And you want to make sure that you're prepared for yourself. So build up an emergency fund and then start saving for the future. Do 
enough people you think know about this save program um it, it, it's out there but i i'm under the impression that not many people really know about it I mean, you nailed it. I think the communication around this new program has been poor. I think the communication around student loan repayments restarting has been very poor. Um, I think there's a lot of borrowers that don't know what to do. And so hopefully they listen to the show and get a little bit of advice. But, you know, that's really the, the key issue here is that you need to take action on your loans. You need to see these programs. You need to apply for them. And now you have about three weeks left before payments are going to resume. And I don't think there's been enough communication around it. So just to clarify, you mentioned earlier, go to student a.gov and that's where you get your house in order you find out how many loans you have um, who's holding that uh, that note for you okay so you do that and on that same website just to be clear for our listeners um, you you apply for save and that same website yeah so you click it it says apply for an income driven repayment plan you go through some questions and save is one of the options right there and it'll typically say like sort by the lowest monthly payment and save will be the lowest monthly payment for you typically hey robert do you have a student loan i used to uh we paid him off you so. did pay it off well, I, did. I mean you're pretty excited about this plan i mean you paid it off the old-fashioned way you took out money and you paid it right I did. I did. I graduated with $42,000 in student loan debt, and I paid them off in about three and a half years. Oh, not bad at all. That's fast. <laughs> Good job. So, I mean, does does it kind of, apparently it doesn't make you angry that people now are, are going to get out of a loan if they want pretty much scot-free in 20 years? It never makes me angry for the individual. Um, I Like I said, I will always support an American not paying the government money if they don't have to. Yeah. But I do think that it's not necessarily great public education policy because we're not doing anything to solve the higher education problem in our country. And that's the politician's fault. That's never my neighbor's fault that's getting loan forgiveness. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, <laughs> you're right about that. I mean, it's like, why would you want to pay more taxes? Why would you want to pay the government more taxes when you do everything you can to um, limit your tax liability. So I, I get it. It's kind of the same platform. Exactly. Like we don't want to pay more in tax than we have to. We shouldn't pay more on our student loans than we have to. And, you know, I think there is a big problem here. And the problem is that we need to take it up with our politicians to, to fix some of this stuff. All right. Hey, Robert, listen, uh, a lot of listeners are going to have uh, more questions about this. So tell us where they can find you. I don't know if you have a website or social media or anything like that, but uh, tell us some information where they can find out more information. Absolutely. So if you want to know anything about your student loans, you can come to thecollegeinvestor.com. We also have a podcast, The College Investor, and you can find us on video channels as well at The College Investor. All right. Sounds good. Well, once again, I feel a little bit smarter than I, I did before the podcast. Always learn something. Um, Take it in. We're always learning something. Hey, Robert, so uh, we thank you so much for being on the On Your Side podcast. Great conversation. And um, I think we've educated a lot of listeners out there. So, yeah, they need to get on that studentaid.gov if they want to get on this uh, this bus for their student debt loan or student loan debt, I should say. Robert, have a great day. Okay. Take it easy. Thanks for having me, guys. It's going to be great. The On Your Side podcast is produced by Brad Denny. Our audio engineer and editor is Todd Martin. Segment producer is Colin Stanton. And I'm Gary Harper. And I'm Susan Campbell. If you have a problem you can't resolve, maybe we can. not Send us a message through azfamily.com or our AZ Family mobile app. Look for the On Your Side section and leave us a message. Thanks so much for listening to the On Your Side podcast. And if you like it, leave us a review. We'll see you next week. On Your Side is on Good Morning Arizona every weekday morning at 6.45 and 7 o'clock and every weekday evening on Good Evening Arizona at 4 and 5 o'clock. You can also catch it on Arizona's Family News at 9 on 3TV every weeknight.